Uh, I'm talking to Walt Morton from Charter One uh, at uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, good morning, Walt. Good morning. Uh, Walt has been in the business for a number of years and uh, does about three million a month. And uh, uh, Walt is unusual uh, in the sense of the interviews that we've previously done. We don't talk to too many people who offer HELOCs, and uh, Jim is an expert on HELOCs, and we'll be talking about that. They're also a, you're a portfolio lender, too, if I remember, right? That's correct, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you something. I always start by people's background, and wondered if you would tell us your market area, uh, and in particular, how you got into the business. Um, well, I got into the business back in 1985. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Jim Kane, who I think you know, I'm sure. Uh, was working for Wachovia Mortgage. Uh, we lived in the same apartment complex, and he introduced me to the business. And uh, I was hired by Wachovia Mortgage in 1985. Uh, started in Durham, North Carolina, as a loan officer. Uh, was promoted to be a branch manager for Wachovia Mortgage in Greenville, South Carolina. And then they promoted me to be the branch manager in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, then in March of 96, 1996, I left and opened up a branch office for American Home Funding, um, who was in 98 bought by Charter One. Right. And that's how I came on, on board with Charter One Mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, market area primarily covers Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, and we do business also in Greensboro and High Point. Uh, market and and how would you describe the breakdown? Now, do you do a lot of govies down there, or is it pretty much conventional no, primarily, territory? I would say uh, ninety percent of our business is conventional business. It is conventional. Yeah. Mm. And what's the reason for that? I'm a little curious. I would think down there with your average loan amount, uh, what what is your average? Somewhere in the hundred seventies, I would guess. Yeah, hundred. Uh, just looked on our report uh, so far year to date, it's been about one hundred seventy five thousand. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> um, it just I, really, our portfolio products cater to the conventional market, um, and we're coming out with a lot of different portfolio programs that just make it more advantageous to go conventional if you can. Well, I agree with that. Uh, there, and I think there is a trend uh, that I think you'd agree that uh, with some uh, portfolio lenders and, and other wholesalers too to try and tailor programs to uh, uh, snap up some of these uh, govies that are getting done because they can do it easier. Yeah, exactly. We have got we do a lot of 85-10 loans, so we do an 85 first and a 10% second, so, and that knocks out PMI. So if a person can come up with the 85% uh, down in closing costs, uh, it just makes it more beneficial to, to do it that way. Mm -hmm. The 10 that you're uh, structuring on the back of it, uh, what is it? Uh, do you have do you have like a 30-year AM, and do you have a call provision with a like a 15-year call, or how do you no, structure it? No, it's just a, a straight 30-year amortization. There's no prepayment penalty, but they can pay it off uh, any time. Uh, that, That's a good know, deal. We we fund that through our Charter One Bank as well. Mm -hmm. And then when you get a blended rate, it's approaching the Govy rate. Well, um, if in general, a fixed rate, yeah, but we can do that on uh, you know any of our portfolio loans on a first mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, fixed rate, five one arm, three three arm, and a six month arm. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to get into that in a little more detail, but I'd like to kind of bounce back in the background since you started in '85. Uh, what are some of the changes? I, and I'm assuming, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that you started out your business uh, primarily calling on realtors. Um, is that true? That, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me ask you something. In the intervening years, and remember our target audience out there that's listening or uh, the 90,000 loan officers in this country, um, what, what changes have you seen in those years uh, with the realtor community and how you approach business? And, and by extension, what I mean is the loan officers, how they should approach their business in today's environment. Well, obviously, uh, back when I started, most real estate companies did not have in-house lenders, and now the majority of the big real estate companies do have in-house lenders. So I think that's one, been one of the biggest changes. Uh, a lot of the realtors are encouraged to use those in-house lenders, if at all possible. So just getting in the door is kind of with a realtor is one of the biggest changes. Uh, it used to be you could walk in and just... You know, talk to realtors, drop off rate sheets, flyers, or what have you. But now that's kind of hard to do. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the in-house loaners in general uh, are up to the quality of uh, most normal originators out there? 
Um, not necessarily looking for a slam, just an observation. Well, here in my marketplace, uh, they've, they've got some pretty good ones. Um, you know, I was asked uh, a year a year and a half, two years ago, by one of my biggest customers, real estate customers, to be their in-house lender, and I refused to do so. Uh, but the person they got is is a quality person. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what 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 advice would you have for loan officers that are going up? Uh, against offices and that kind of situation. And I'm glad to hear you say, I'm not glad in one sense to hear you say that it's so pervasive in your market area, but I think it is a fact of life today. And I think loan officers out there are going to need to deal with it head on. And so what's your advice to people out there that are calling on realtors in that kind of situation? Well, I would just, um, you know, stay in touch with the realtor, even though you know that they are, um, going to be encouraged by their sales manager and, and broker to, to use that uh, uh, in-house lender. But typically, most realtors are going to give out three names, typically three real, uh, three lenders. Um, and you're, you know, as a lender, you just want to be one of those three. Um, you know, buyers typically, I mean, they, they, they want to shop around a little bit. And uh, if you could still be on the good, on the list of, lenders with that realtor, uh, you know, you're still going to get some opportunities. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you've got some niche products, you you definitely want to, you know, make an appointment and, and make sure that those realtors know that you have this product that, and how it's beneficial to them. Do you think loan officers need to have a reason to approach these offices in today's environment or uh, just walk in and try and get what, you know, you and I would call FaceTime? No, I, I think uh, more and more it's you need to set appointments up and have a, have a, something to sell the, the uh, realtors. You know, really, first of all, I think you need to uncover what their needs are, and then if you have something that can address their needs, you know, make sure they're aware of it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but on the on the other hand, uh, that's easier said than done. Uh, any tricks uh, uh, or, or things that you do to try and get around that kind of situation? Uh, and what I'm referring to, for example, a lot of uh, a lot of brokers, uh, the managers today are actually blocking access to, into those offices. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's when you got to set an appointment up. I think it, because you, it's it's hard just to walk in and get past the receptionist these days. Um, you know, here at our company, we we do have some unusual products, so it makes it a little easier. Um, if you're a you know, a loan officer that's out there. Um, I think you know. First of all, you want to sell yourself to them and, and uh, tell them that you are going to be accessible. Uh, one thing I do is just make sure they know that my home phone number is on my card. They can call me after hours. Uh, I'm available uh, to answer questions on the weekends and, and just to help them out anytime. I'm, I'm, I try to be a partner to them. You know, uh, that I'm just not another loan officer out there. I'm going to give them top quality service they can count on me to be there and um but what if i acted as devil's advocate for a little bit uh and said that that's all well and true but you and i have been or i've been around a lot more years than you but you, you have your spurs in too obviously since 1985 and we all know that there's a lot of loan officers in this business that don't make it that are new they're heading in and the first thing out of their mouths is is that I'm going to be around, I'm going to return your phone calls. I mean, it's almost like a mantra uh, that comes out. And then, of course, uh, two to three months later, they're not showing up anymore, uh, which, of course, totally jades the uh, realtors out there. Mm-hmm. And they learn not to trust loan officers in general because of that. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it's part of it's understandable. You have loan officers that are spreading a pretty wide net, seeing what sticks, and then working that. But the, uh, uh, I, I think the effect on the business is you get a lot of realtors uh, that get kind of freaked out that if they deal with somebody, that uh, they're not going to be back. So um, I think that's all well and good, but I'd like to ask you what you specifically uh, do in your business to uh, take care of that kind of problem. Well, I think the first the first thing is when you you know when you get the chance to to do a deal with them, you've got to really live up to the standards and show them good superior service. You've got to communicate with them. I think communication is one of the main things the realtors are looking for. Um, you know, calling them when the appraisal comes in, calling them if there's any problems, 
being up front and telling them, hey, this if this deal isn't going to work, go ahead and let them know right up front. Uh, I think they respect you more so by that as opposed to trying to push it through knowing it's not going to go through. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've just always been there just to try to give top quality service. Yeah, I, I think um, there's a common thread that runs through all the interviews I do, and it is that uh, quality of service, which by that you extension mean, you know, establishing relationships, uh, being there for people, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, dealing in relationships is so very important. Uh, let me ask you something. When it comes time to uh, your customers, um, how do you break down your business? Do you, how much do you get from realtors today versus referrals um, versus uh, like you know sources uh, like CPAs and um, you know people like that, financial people? I would say probably uh, my personal business, 80, 85 percent of my business comes from realtor referrals. Directly. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. So you do a large amount with realtors. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When, when, when you get that realtor referral, um, how do you handle them from the get-go? I assume the first call is a, a phone call coming into you. Yeah. Uh, but then I'd like to take a, uh, take it down a couple notches and, you know, how do you get together with them? Where do you get together? You know, how do you get that quality time to establish a rapport? And then I'd like to get into what you do afterwards to maintain that database and work it for referrals. Well, um, what typically the, the bar will call me up and they'll introduce themselves and say, I was referred to you by, you know, X realtor. And typically they're either ready to apply for a mortgage or they're, <clears throat> they're wanting to get pre qualified and we'll go through the numbers. And, and mean, a lot of it's over the phone now. I know, you know, borrowers are busy. A lot of times they don't have time to come in. So I'll try and, and say that's my that's my special moment right there to go ahead and and capture that customer and not lose that customer. So initially I'll try and, and introduce myself and tell them what we have and just see what they want. If they are ready, to, if they just want to pre, be pre-qualified, I'll do that. And then I'll tell them, you know, that's all said and good because we've done all this on paper, but we can take this a step further if you want, and we can actually get you pre-approved. And I explain to them what pre-approved is, where we actually take the application, get them credit approved, and so forth. Do you find that they respond to that? Yeah. Because I think that's a great idea. It's not much a a true commitment on their part. It's it's, And also I explain to them by getting pre-approved, it puts them in a better bargaining position when they do find the house because we can give them a letter saying they're pre-approved for X amount of dollars. And, you know, as a seller, they may be able to negotiate a little bit more with the seller um, knowing they've been pre-approved, the credit report's been pulled, and so forth. And most realtors appreciate that as well. Because uh, once I do all that, I'll call the realtor and tell them, you know, thank them for the referral, um, tell them we spoke, and actually tell them what we did, whether we actually just did a pre-qualification or if we took the step and went through the pre-approval. Mm. Assuming you're using uh, DU or... Yeah, uh, it, it's pretty extensively at this point. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we are all on laptops, and so we can pull the credit report, uh, and then once we put everything in there, just you know, uh, do a, a transfer over to DU and, and just do the underwriting through DU. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you finding that uh, most of the people that you work with uh, uh, qualify for DU? Yeah, most of my folks I'm working with. Uh, although I've had a couple, you know, credit score issues don't meet the conventional uh, requirement, but uh, most of them are, do meet DU requirements. Mm-hmm. I, I know you have some expertise in, uh, in HELOCs, and, and I, I, I do not want to forget about it. In fact, I want to focus on a little bit later, mm-hmm. but I still do want to take this train down uh, with the client. So uh, when you take the loan app, do you take it using a laptop directly or do you take it by hand? No, I do it on a laptop. You do it on a laptop with them. And so right. they sign all the releases, everything's done right there. That's correct. And you do it in your office so they come to you? Yeah, most of the time I'm either gonna, they're either coming into my office or I'll do it over the telephone. If I do it over the telephone, I'll fax them the authorization that allows me to pull their credit report. And they fax sure. back to me so that we can go ahead and proceed with that. Mm-hmm. Do you find that you can develop relationships that are strong using the phone versus somebody coming in? Yeah, you know, especially if uh, they, you know, time is, is a critical issue with people these days. Um, 
and if if I I mean I can tell them, hey, it only takes me ten or fifteen minutes to go through this loan application. Um, I can take everything, and then if you want to come in and, and get everything signed at that point, it, it's just that less time we have to spend together when you come in. Because a lot of times they'll come in on their lunch hour, or it's going to be after hours. Mm-hmm. So they're ready to proceed typically. Uh, especially if they like what I have to say regarding our rates and programs, et cetera. Right. Well, once you've got that done, what happens in the processing to closing phase? Uh, do you have a team set up? Uh, how, how does it work in your yeah, company? Uh, we, I have a, we're, we do local processing right here in our branch. So once I take the loan application and I run it through DU, um, I'll give it to my, we have a secretary receptionist uh, slash half, she's like a half processor. Mm-hmm. And if there's any documentation that needs to be ordered, I give it to her, and she she does that. And then she, in turn, gives it to my processor, who will do the follow-up. And then once everything comes in, she will submit it, get it ready to submit for underwriting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I can sign off on in our within our company. I'm what they call a DU certified user. Yeah, I understand. So I can sign off on the loan, uh, certain loans myself on the credit part without it going to underwriting. I, I do have to send the appraisal to my underwriter to sign off, but I can sign off on the credit part. I see. As long as it's a, you know, the DU comes back and it's an approved eligible DU loan. Yeah, right, exactly. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, once that's done, uh, are, are you trying to get these uh, to settlement within 30 days? Uh, now, I understand that uh, obviously it depends on the, the realtor contract anyway, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, are you getting these approved within two to three weeks, let's say? In yeah, general. within our company, we have kind of a goal that uh, we try to get co- a conventional loan uh, approved within 10 days mm-hmm. uh, through DU. Yeah, and of course, with DU today, that's within 18 days. Pardon me? I think an FHA VA loan, I think it's 18 to 21 days, something like that. Mm-hmm. So and, we're typically operating within a 30-day cycle. Right, exactly. And I, I'm sure the realtors, uh, especially uh, uh, the listing agents, too, they, they appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Well, DU is such a powerful tool, and with me being a certified user, uh, especially once I take the loan application on a pre-approval or a contract basis, uh, once I take it, I'll go ahead and run it through DU, and if it's approved, I'll call the realtor up and say, hey, we're, we're already pre-approved. You know, subject to the appraisal being done. Yeah, right. That's a it's a very strong tool today, and you and I have been around the track a while, and uh, I'm, I'm sure both of us can remember the days when something like that it was just a far fetched dream. Oh, yeah. And if you could get something done in 30, and in some cases 45, and in some cases even 60 days, depending on the government process, uh, you know, you were considered doing a good job today. Well, I remember back in '86 when you know we were doing something refinances and there was no streamlined refinance process back then and we were telling people not to lock in because we could not guarantee the rate lock so uh, things have certainly changed since yeah and in some cases for good reason during that period that you're alluding to uh, the market got so crazy uh, that you really could not get the stuff done in a, in a 45 or 60 day fashion that created some problems with states uh, Maryland was one that I'm familiar with I, I ran about eight states at that time but uh, Maryland was just going livid uh, because as you know during that period rates actually did spike up at a point right. and there were a lot of people hanging out there that had locked in and all you had two situations you had situations uh, where the lake uh, where the lock was just legitimately going to fall out it couldn't be done you had other situations where they did not lock in and then you had the ugly situation during that period of time where you had companies that were going to lose a lot of money they didn't lock on on the other end of the deal they were playing the market right and potentially uh you were talking wipeout situations at that time so what they did is just as you well know they just kind of marked everything the market said that's the way it is and uh, a lot of these people with that period of time started to go to the legislatures. And I think that was one of the first real starts where uh, consumers got upset as a group and things started to fundamentally change. And, and now you see a lot of states that uh, have uh, their own mandated uh, lock-in procedures. Right. And that's a direct result of the time period that, that you're talking about. Exactly. Well, let me ask you something. Once you're uh, uh, assuming that you've established that relationship, uh, what do you do after that? I'm finding that people who are successful 
uh, in the business like you are, they they seem to have a way of managing that. Uh, they have ways of following up, uh, whether it's by letter, sending gifts. I talked to someone yesterday. I think I'm going to dub her the candy girl who brings candy around. It's very effective. Uh, it, it was a, a very interesting conversation. So everybody has something different. Yeah. And I'd like to know how you uh, keep in touch with your clients. Well, I, you know, I always do it with a phone call. Uh, okay. Just follow up on every referral they send me, uh, whether it's, you know, telling them where we stand or thanking them for the referral. Uh, so phone call is, is a big way. And then, um, you know, after the loan closes, um, I send them a, uh, a thank you letter. Right. Do you handwrite it or it comes off the machine? Um, I've done a combination of both. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll handwrite a lot of them myself and just, you know, a short letter, thanking them, putting cards in there. And, you know, sometimes I'll send a gift to them as well. Great. Um, what we, about on an ongoing basis? I mean, what happens six months or a year from now? Do you, sorry, say that one more time. Uh, what happens in, uh, from a long-term basis? How do you keep in touch with them? Um, well, I've got a data bank of uh, realtors that have referred me business uh, through, you know, in the customers they referred me. And uh, if I haven't heard from a realtor in a while, I'll just call them up and maybe take them to lunch or, mm -hmm. you know, just um, send them a letter. What about the What about the clients? Uh, do you keep in touch uh, beyond a six month period? You know, the clients I I try to just uh, every now and then, especially if we come out with a new program or. Uh, it's back when we came out with these home equity lines, I, I definitely sent letters out to the clients at that point. Right. Because so many of them would ask me before we had the home equity lines, well, do you have home equity lines? Or they'd call me back, and then I sent a mass mailing of letters that we are now offering this home equity line and and uh, what the specifics were. And I, you would, you'd be amazed at the amount of callbacks I got on that and how many we did. Yeah. So I, I've got a data bank of that. I'll, I'll send out a mailing to... You know, I should do it more frequently, but I probably do it once every six months. Good. Okay. I understand. Well, most We're of the people at your level do something. I'm sorry? I say most of the people at your level do something. Yeah, exactly. And and I think that distinguish them, distinguishes people like you from loan officers at the bottom of the chain uh, who are wondering why they don't do business. And, you know, they they would know more thinking uh, of creating a database and keeping in touch of the man on the moon. And, you know, it's just like business thrown away. Well, you just got to remember that, you know, these people, especially if they're buying a starter home, they're going to be moving up and, you know, if you stay in touch with them, they'll call you back for another loan once they buy another house. So yeah. it's just not it's more than a one time transaction. It's it's a relationship you're developing with. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh you have some expertise in the area uh that not too many loan officers do out there. I happen to know that since you and I've chatted before. Uh, and I wondered uh, if, uh, you know, w once again, without getting into anything uh, proprietary to your company, uh, I wondered if you would talk about HELOCs and and how these things are structured and uh, what you do and the advantages of them. Uh, a lot of our loan officers out there uh, wouldn't know a HELOC if it hit them. And uh, uh, there's a lot of advantages, uh, PMI is one on the deal you were talking about, uh, to using them. And, uh, um, and you're also a portfolio lender, too. But mm -hmm. uh, leaving aside any particular rare programs that you may have that would be, uh, you know, just to your company, uh, I wondered if you would get into that area for our listeners and discuss it and some of the advantages of using them. Okay. Well, um, we do sec true second mortgages, and we also do HELOCs. Um, we do the seconds as a, a selling tool to avoid the PMI, basically. I mean, it's it's just a, a true purchase money second where they can borrow up to 95% uh, with our second. In other words, we'll structure an 85% first and a 10% second or a 5% second. Um, and we just go through and explain to them the benefits of doing that, um, how it does knock out the PMI, uh, we fund the seconds uh, through our parent bank. Um, we do a separate application, although it's 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 only like three forms they sign for the second, um, and it, everything's underwritten by our underwriters. So when they come in, they're they're applying for the first, second, and a HELOC. Uh, in other words, if if they want to, we can do an 85 percent first, a 10 percent second, and a 5 percent HELOC uh, in one sitting with the customer. Yeah, would you explain to listeners out there why you do that, the structure of the third one? 
Um, well, basically, uh, the our parent bank just just obviously they make more money on a second and a HELOC than they do on a first mortgage. So mm-hmm. it's what they call an energized asset. Um, but the second is is mainly uh, a selling tool we have. Uh, number one, to get to avoid PMI. Number two, it's it's beneficial to them because it typically, if you compare the payment on the split mortgage like that to a say a 95 percent loan with PMI. The payment is cheaper doing it that way. It also gives the customer uh, uh, flexibility in a sense that if they uh, want to pay that second off quicker, then that payment just drops out. Um, or if they, let's say they don't have a lot of cash now, but they're going to run into some cash, they could just pay that second off totally and uh, you know get rid of it, and they end up with an 85% loan and avoid PMI altogether. Mm-hmm. The home equity line. Uh, it's just so valuable to our company because um, obviously people have borrowing needs after they close on their mortgage, you know, whether it's to fix the home up, you know, to buy things for their home, and it's just a way that they can borrow money and, and still have an interest write-off, and it's beneficial to the customer that way, but it's still also beneficial to our company. Yeah, and this, and it starts the establishment of a total relationship. All right, and it's just a one-stop shop for the customer and for a company where they just meet with one loan officer, apply one time, and have one closing for all three loans. Since, since I mean, uh, uh, it, it just makes sense going in that most people of your clients out there really aren't thinking about something like that when they see you, especially doing a, you know an 85-10-5 with a HELOC. Uh, do you find that they, they uh, find it attractive and it helps cement the relationships when you can bring this sort of stuff to the table? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Most most people, when they're shopping for a mortgage, the, the home equity line does, does not come into their play at that point, and it, but it's our job to explain to them how it's beneficial uh, and, you know, how it's not costing them anything, and it, it's just there in case they ever need it in the future. You know, their financial status can change, and we're underwriting their loan based on how they stand right now, which is probably, if they're buying a house, they're in pretty good financial shape or but you know they may be laid off in the future or things may change and they may not qualify in the future so now is a great time for them to go ahead and apply for that home equity line <laughs> and once they find out it's uh, the benefits of it and it's not costing them anything most of the time they'll go ahead and take it uh, once it's, it's really not a hard sell yeah right exactly and and, uh, and it really does create that relationship Right. But let, let's talk about something. I, I, I only do it about every fifth interview, but I, I like to throw it in because it always stands out there. And, and that's uh, the issue of pricing and uh, how do you feel about pricing and how important is pricing out there since 85% of your business is coming from realtors? Um, are you starting to feel some of the pressure from the Internet uh, where they're you know looking at the Internet as an informational base? Uh, uh, let's talk about pricing a bit, and its importance or lack of importance in the transaction. Oh, it's definitely important. <laughs> um, you know, and I think the internet is is there in a sense that people are are searching the internet and seeing what lenders are offering out there in terms of rates. I don't know that I've lost any business to the internet yet. I mean, they may have lost a couple deals. Um, I think the mortgage process is such a big big uh, thing for, for borrowers that they like a little hand-holding and a little face-to-face uh, uh, personal touch now. That may change in the future, but um, there are a lot of brokers out there that when business gets slow, they'll certainly uh, you know get sharp with their prices, and lenders like ourselves, um, it, it really creates a hard time for us in terms of competing. Um, we just start selling uh, some of our niche products if that happens. Um, but, you know, fixed rate mortgages, it, it's its just a com- very, very competitive competitive uh, market out there right now. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's the old saying where you're never going to be lowest. Uh, there's always someone lower than you. And uh, the name of the game is just to be in the market. Exactly. And then, you know, then the rest is is kind of up to you. I'll try to, um, you know, you got to have a competitive rate, definitely. But um, you know, you got to kind of explain to customers on your telephone interview when you're talking to them, you know, what they're looking for, and uh, maybe probe a little bit more and just get into things other than rate 
and you know let them understand that a mortgage application is just more than getting the best rate. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let me change subjects on you a bit. Uh, how do you handle uh, stress in your bed? First off, do you find the business stressful? Uh, second off, if you do, how do you handle stress and how do you manage your time? Oh yeah, <laughs> the business is certainly stressful. Um, well, you know, I just try to keep everything in perspective. Um, I've got a family with three boys, and um, I just give it all I have when I'm here at the at the shop, at the office. And, uh, and my, my wife's understanding. I get a lot of calls on weekends and after hours. But, you know, we just have good family time together after hours. Uh, I coach baseball and also my kids in basketball. So um, I just – that's my stress relief right there, mm -hmm. just spending time with my kids and, and you know, getting involved in their lives. Yeah, so you make quality time for yourself. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, most, like right now, for example, uh, I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, and they're both in Little League Baseball, and I'm head baseball coach for my middle son and assistant baseball coach for my oldest son. So right now I'm I'm leaving a lot of times right at 5 o'clock just to get out to the baseball field for games or practice or what have you. Do you take loan apps on the weekends or at night? Yeah, if I have to. Uh, you use the words "if I have to." Does it mean do you try and uh, bring them in to a, a kind of a weekday environment where they come in if you can? That's what I try to do. Yeah, because I I try to keep family time special, um, but knowing that realtors do business after hours and on the weekends, and I do encourage them, and if they do need me, to call me. But uh, most people understand that, and they respect after hour time, so that's why. I try to do it during the week if I can. Mm -hmm. um, going back to um, how you create your business, um, you get 85% of your business from realtors. Uh, I'm going to throw a statement out to you uh, that's uh, bannered about by some of the top-level people, and I'd just like your comment on it. And, it, and it. and it goes basically like this, that uh, for the loan officers that are out there today that are trying to uh, either start their business or move it up to what you and I would call the next level, uh, that they should concentrate on what are called centers of influence. And by that they mean instead of concentrating on uh, uh, maybe 50 different realtors to zero in on those 10 or 15 that really can crank some volume to them. Um, do you agree with a statement like that? And Yeah, I, I certainly do. Because, I mean, you can only spread yourself so thin and, uh, you know, you're not going to provide the quality of service and you're not going to be able to be there for 50 realtors like you can for 10 or 15. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, being in their face and showing up and giving them uh, the, the service that they're going to expect from you to 50 realtors is going to be totally different than 10 to 15. Yeah, I think a lot, the reason I'm saying that is that uh, increasingly over the years as I've uh, kind of viewed what loan officers in general do and the fact that I was a manager for, for many years, uh, I think the loan officers out there uh, make a mistake, uh, uh, especially the young ones, make a serious mistake when they just throw this net so far out. And part of it's understanding. You know, they, they don't know who their clients are going to be. On the other hand, they're getting out there, they're running around to 20 different offices, uh, and they're not getting any quality time. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, you, you've got to find some common common ground with the realtors, uh, and you've got to get in the door with the realtor, and that's that's. A lot of times, that's the biggest challenge is just getting in the door with them. But, mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of trick? You know, I actually want to stop and uh, talk about that. Uh, getting in the door. Uh, you know, years ago, uh, uh, when you and I were uh, doing our business, and then in '85, I think it was on the street. I've kind of forgotten what I got off by then. Uh, but getting into a realtor's office uh, was really not that big a deal. Um, today. It's, as you say, you know, in some cases, it's the only deal. Because mm -hmm. if you can't get in, uh, you know, you're not going anywhere. That's right. So what would you recommend to people out there? How should they, you know, get through the door and get FaceTime with these people? It's all well and good to say you ought to have an appointment. But if you're starting off and you've only been in the business a year or two years, you know, that's a lot easier said than done. You, you need to go outside the box and uh, use some creativity to do that, and that's my question to you. I just, uh, I would just, you know, try and set a time up 
respect, knowing that, that the realtors are busy and, and their their time is, is precious and valuable. Uh, but typically, you know, a breakfast appointment is a good time to okay. meet them. Um, or some of them are lunch. But I, I would try and set up a breakfast appointment with them. It's, it's what I try to do. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny and parallel to that. Uh, they're in, up in the uh, Washington metropolitan area, which uh, is a real high-tech corridor now, uh, especially in Northern Virginia. Uh, most of the uh, IT people, uh, when they want to get together for, uh, you know, uh, power meetings or whatever, uh, they're doing breakfast. There are clubs all over the place, and they meet at 7, you know, 7, 7.15, uh, at some of the Marriotts around the Beltway and whatever, and uh, and that's where an incredible amount of relationships are established and business done. Well, once you get the day going, I mean, I know my personal experience, I, I hardly have time to eat lunch, uh, and I, realtors are probably the same way. So breakfast is ten, typically a good time to get together, get a cup of coffee, and it's, you know, Get a get a good start for the day with with the realtor. Yeah, it, I think it all comes down, don't you, to uh, quality time. I mean, when you're sitting there over breakfast, uh, you can talk about the kids or whatever it is. You can form relationships. Exactly, I can just get that common ground going. Right, and I think you'd agree that relationships are really kind of the keys to the business. Yeah, that's my success. I mean, you, I've got a lot of relationships out there, and. Uh, you know that's that's what's kept me going. Mm-hmm. What, what what do you mean personally by having a relationship with a realtor? And and let me just kind of give you the box that I'm I'm putting you in. Uh, there are realtors out there that maintain a very strict and and I have to say very successful uh, business uh, by just having a truly a professional relationship. You know it's business 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 and they mm-hmm. prove themselves by the quality of their business. Uh, there's other people <laughs> that uh, that really try and form social uh, uh, bonding relationships, and uh, I've never taken a position on it. I don't think there's an answer to the question, so I'm just asking how you do it. Well, I, I've got a, I guess a little bit of combination of both. I I don't really do a lot of whining and dining with realtors after hours because you know I just, that's kind of my time right now with kids and, yeah, and sure. so forth. But uh, um, so a lot of my relationships with realtors are, are business, but I mean I, I go to church with a lot of realtors. I, my kids are go to school with their kids with realtors' kids, and we see I see them at school events and various things like that. And, and you know when we get together for lunch or breakfast or something, I'll you know we we socialize that way. But um, a lot of it is just having a name out there, being in the market for so long, and knowing that. If there's a, a lender in town that can get the job done, they know I can get it done. Mm-hmm. What kind of competition do you have in your market area? Uh, I know doing the kind of volumes that you do every month, obviously you're you're cranking some stuff. Um, is it a large market area down there? Um, well, the Winston-Salem uh, market itself, I mean, I guess our uh, – we – the metropolitan area is over, you know, a million, million two, something like that, in terms of if you have Greensboro High Point in there. But um, that's kind of an, a fringe market for us. Went to Salem, Forsyth County, and, and the counties surrounding us, I guess we have, you know, over 500,000 people within the immediate market. Um, but competition, I mean, Wachovia Bank is, is based here. Uh, they're a large, I guess they're the 15th, 16th largest bank in the country. Yeah, I imagine they're pretty strong competition. Yeah, Based here, and mm-hmm. you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the big banks are based here in North Carolina, so we compete against them pretty well. And then we have a lot of brokers here too. Uh, we have a, lo- a one big local S and L that's that's based here, and that's their primary business is mortgage lending, and they do a lot of advertising. But they don't have a lot of the products that we offer. They're just more of the plain vanilla products. Mm-hmm. Is competition fierce there? Oh yeah, it's it's uh, dog eat dog out there right now. <laughs> Um, the rate is the big big key, but getting around that is what I try to do, is mm-hmm. get around the rate issue. Well, you're, you're in an environment right now uh, where rates are uh, creeping up, uh, and do you find that's presenting a problem at all? Well, it is. Uh, I think if they continue to go up, it's, it's going to knock some people out of the market. But uh, the market for the last two months has been good, um, and we're just seeing people more open to ARM, ARM products. Mm-hmm. Um, 
knowing that probably rates will come down and they can always refinance out of it. So I don't think it's really stopping the home buyer. Um, it's just creating a little more competition because everybody's fighting for for the market that's out there. Right. It also gives you a chance to show off your wares and what you can do to solve their problems, too. Right. Um, are you doing a lot of, uh, because you got to get it to some sort of a differential in rate from the 30, are you doing a lot of three ones and five ones? Yeah, we're doing doing some of that, but we've got a, a six-month arm that's been just tremendously popular out there. Really? But It's a six-month arm, and uh, it's one of our portfolio products. Um you want me to get any specifics on that? No, not really. Okay. But but in, in a general sense, you can talk about a six month arm. Yeah, it's a six month arm. It's a pretty pretty unique product out there, and uh, we've we've uh, in terms of salesmanship, we've been able to sell that w- real well though, with it being unique. And sometimes people, when they hear six month arm, knowing it can change in six months, they get a little. Uh, successful to that, but well, I get nervous thing, just listening it's, to it. It's a great program. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. Uh, everybody's a little bit different in their psyche. I, I'm one of these people that would take a much higher 30-year fixed, uh, and damn it, uh, just because I get scared to death of uh, six months arms. Yeah, I well, get scared I, to death of three-year arms, but that's just me. Yeah, but this in this, this interest rate environment, uh, it's it's good alternative to fixed rates. Mm-hmm. Well, did the people qualify at the first year or after the first recast? Uh, they'll qualify at the initial rate. That's one of the nice things about it. Yeah, that, that's a real good play there. Yeah. As you know, for many years when the uh, six-month arms and the one-year arms were coming out, people were qualifying at those rates. And as you know, during the SNLs, they were qualifying at teaser rates. Right. Uh, but then it kind of uh, flipped back the other way where they were – uh, qualifying uh, at the first recast. That's correct. Yeah, and we have we've had that too happen, but uh, this particular program here, we qualify them at the initial rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also also said that you're a branch manager. How many loan officers do you have under you? Well, I've got uh, two in this branch, and then we've got a couple satellites. Uh, one, I've got two other satellites that report into me. Mm-hmm. So I've got three other loan officers in those satellites that report into me. Does it create a problem with you doing the volume that you do and, and having to manage? You know, sometimes I think it does um, in a sense that, you know, the loan officers maybe feel like I'm getting more of than their fair, I'm getting more of the business and, and they're not getting it as much. Um, and in terms of, of management, it, it creates a problem sometimes. But, you know, you, it's hard to slow the business down when it's just you know when they're calling me all the time. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the that's kind of a problem that I, I deal with. Yeah, but that's kind of, isn't that kind of the the nature of the business with that uh, years ago. Um, um, really, most of the managers that uh, worked in offices were not producing managers. It's hard for the young people out there to understand right. that there really was a time when you did not have. Uh, a producing loan officer, and of course, with margins getting thinner, uh, the dynamics of that change drastically. And, and that's kind of the nature of the business. You know, how do, if you're a producing branch manager, you know, how do you effectively manage, and at the same time, get out there and do the numbers that that you need to do? That's correct. Yeah, it's, but that's how we bring value to our to company. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And typically. I know in our company, the branch managers are the most experienced and typically the biggest producers. Right. Well, I think that's I think that's pretty much true everywhere. Right. Uh, all things being equal, uh, unless you have a brickhead, uh, you know, you're going to go with the with the guy who can bring the most volume in, and who also can manage the office. I mean, there's no sense of bringing someone in who does an incredible amount of volume, and all of a sudden lets the rest of the office fall apart. I mean, that doesn't work. That's correct. Yeah. But what about training? Um, do you have any particular training programs, and and how do you feel about training beyond the generic? You know, uh, I, I know everyone would say yeah, training's important, but uh, uh, maybe a little more in depth on that. How do you feel about it? Well, it's something that uh, especially new loan officers look for. Um, I mean, and you, you got to have it because you got to be knowledgeable out there, and, and you've got to know what you're talking about if you're out there trying to get business with realtors. Um, our company has some training programs they put loan officers through, um, but it, it, we I also spend time if I hire a new loan officer to make sure they know the right way to take a loan application and know the you know the disclosures that have to be signed and the time frame they have to be signed and so forth. Um, 
So, you know, I, I, I spend some time, even if they go through a training program, to train them to make sure I know this is the way that I, I would like for them to do it mm -hmm. um, within my branch. Yeah, do you go out in the street with them? Uh, yeah, initially we do, especially if it's a new loan officer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a new loan officer, um, I try to maybe do one or two calls, but I don't, it's, in our market, a lot of the real estate companies know me, and I know they're out there trying to establish a presence, and I don't want to take the, you know, the, the call away from them. So I may go out with once or twice, and they can kind of observe me, but then... But then they got to get out and do it. Then they've got to get out themselves and do it. So, and if I'm out there with them, and it's a realtor that knows me, then it's kind of taking the glory away from them. Right. So, well, uh, you know, it's a, it, it's a it's a tough business out there for loan officers because ultimately, you know, they say there's two things: know your product, know how to close. You know, and the rest is all you know extra. Uh, but eventually, you do have to get out there and you have to call on these offices yourself. And that kind of leads me into a, a, a just kind of a general comment. Uh, may sound self-serving, but it's certainly backed up by evidence in the industry today. And comments from Freddie and Fannie and the NAMB and uh, MBA uh, that there just is not enough uh, quality training out there for loan officers today. Mm -hmm. that, oh, I agree with that. Um, why, why do you think that is? Is it the Emphasis on getting out there and bringing production in now. It's just that there's not good methodologies. Well, uh, it's pervasive. I mean, uh, you could tell me whether you have it in your company or not. It would be Im immaterial for my talk here. But as a general statement, uh, why do you think this exists in the industry? Well, I think a lot of times, I know in our company, maybe this is the feeling, and maybe companies elsewhere. But if, especially if it's a new loan officer. Uh, the companies may say, well, this is a rookie loan officer. Is he going to make it or not? Do we want to spend the money and time to invest in all, doing all this training? And then if he doesn't make it three months from now, you know, we, we really wasted a lot of money and time and effort to try and train him for nothing. Um, I don't know how true that is. Oh, I think that, I think you hit it right on the mark. But that I, I can see that's where a lot of companies are probably coming from on that. Right. I, I think one of the proofs of that is the if you look at the ads in the newspapers around the country, uh, the ads are almost always uh, looking for loan officers. You know, year and a half, two years experience required. Correct. You rarely see the you know will train from scratch. Correct. Uh, for that simple reason, and uh, you know everybody's out there for those people who've been around that have already been trained, right? Yeah, and, uh, I, and I can kind of relate to that because last November we hired a loan officer that uh, was real impressive on an interview. He's been in non-conforming lending for a couple years, um, and then he wanted to get out of that business and, and get into conforming business, which is what we do. And you know he came on board. He met with me, met with my boss, and we both liked him came over and spent some time training him and sending him to laptop training and so forth, and then he ended up leaving after about three or four months. Right. He just couldn't get the relationships going. Yeah. But it is, once again, it's as you said, it's a relationship business. You, you have to be able to establish those relationships. That's correct. Well, look, uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, I know we're out of time, and uh, I wanted to thank you very much for your comments today. I thought they... Uh, we're really good and on target, and I think they reflect the market uh, as it exists out there, and I think you've been a great help to the listeners. So thank you so much, Walt, for talking to us today. Well, thanks for calling me. I certainly enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, I did too.